I drifted often in fevered visions to my family and the friends I'd known and had lost forever in Australia. I also thought of Kader Bhai, Abdullah, Kasim Ali, Johnny Sigar, Araju, Vikram, Betty, Ola, Kavita, and Didier. I thought of Prabhakar, and I wished that I could tell him how much I loved his honest, optimistic, brave, and generous heart. And sooner or later, my thoughts always found their way to Carla. Every day, every night, every hour that I counted out with my burning eyes. And it seemed to my dreaming mind that Carla saved me. I was thinking of her when strong arms lifted me and the chains fell from my wounded ankles and guards marched me to the prison official's office. I was thinking of her. The guards knocked. At an answering call, they opened the door. They waited outside when I entered. In the small office, I saw three men. The prison official with the short gray hair, a plain clothes cop, and Wickram Patel sitting around a metal desk. Oh, fuck, Wickram shouted. Oh, man, you look, you look fucking terrible. Oh, fuck, oh, fuck. What have you done to this guy? The official and the cop exchanged neutral glances, but didn't reply. Sit down, the prison official commanded. I remained standing on weakening legs. Sit down, please. I sat and stared at Wickram with tongue-locked amazement. The flat black hat hanging on his back by the cord at his throat and his black vest, shirt, and scrolled flamenco pants seemed wildly exotic and yet the most reassuringly familiar costume I could imagine. My eyes began to lose focus in the elaborate whirls and scrolls on his embroidered vest and I pulled my stare back to his face. That face wrinkled and winced as he stared at me. I hadn't looked into a mirror for four months. Wickham's grimaces gave me a fairly good idea of how near to death he believed me to be. He held out the black shirt with the lasso figures that he'd taken off his back to give to me in the rain four months before. I brought, I brought your shirt, he said falteringly. What, what are you doing here? A friend sent me, he replied. A very good friend of yours. Oh, fuck, Lynn. You look like dogs have been chewing on you. I don't want to freak you out or nothing, but you look like they dug you up after they fucking killed you, man. Just stay cool. I'm here, man. I'm going to get you the fuck out of this place. Taking that as his cue, the official coughed and gestured toward the cop. The cop gave the lead back to him, and he addressed Wickham, a kind of smile pinching the soft skin around his eyes. 10,000, he said, in American dollars, of course. 10 fucking thousand, Wickham exploded. Are you crazy? I can buy 50 guys out of this place with 10,000. Fuck that, man. 10,000, the official repeated, with the calm and authority of a man who knows that he brought the only gun to a knife fight. He rested his hands flat on the metal desk, and his fingers rolled through once in a little Mexican wave. No fucking way, man. Are, take a look at the guy. What are you giving me, Yad? You fucking destroyed the guy. You think he's worth 10,000 in this condition? The cop took a folder from a slender vinyl briefcase and slid it across the desk to Wickram. The folder contained a single sheet of paper. Reading it quickly, Wickram's lips pressed outward and his eyes widened in an expression of impressed surprise. Is this you, he asked me? Did you escape from jail in Australia? I stared at him evenly, my feverish eyes not wavering. I didn't reply. How many people know about this? He asked the plainclothes cop. Not so many, the cop replied in English, but enough to need 10,000 for keeping this information a private matter. Oh shit, we could have sighed. There goes my bargaining. Fuck it. I'll have the money in half an hour. Clean him up and get him ready. There's something else. I interrupted, and they all turned to look at me. There are two men in my dormitory. They tried to help me, and the overseers or the guards gave them six months more, but they finished their time. I want them to walk out the gate with me. The cop gave an inquiring look at the prison official. He responded by waving his hand dismissively and wagging his head in agreement. The matter was a mere trifle. The men would be freed. 
And there's another guy, I said flatly. His name's Mahesh Malhotra. He can't raise his bail. It's not much, a couple of thousand rupees. I want you to let Vikram pay his bail. I want him to walk out with me. The two men raised their palms and exchanged identical expressions of bewilderment. The fate of such a poor and insignificant man never intruded upon their material ambitions or their spiritual disenchantments. They turned to Wickham. The prison official thrust out his jaw as if to say, he's insane, but if that's what he wants. Wickham stood to leave, but I raised my hand and he sat down again quickly. And there's another one, I said. The cop laughed out loud. Arek, he spluttered through the laugh. One more? He's an African. He's in the African compound. His name's Rahim. They broke both his arms. I don't know if he's alive or dead. If he's alive, I want him too. The cop turned to the prison official, hunching his shoulders and raising the palm of his hand in a question. I know the case, the prison official said, wagging his head. It is a police case. The fellow carried on a shameless affair with the wife of a police inspector. The inspector quite rightly arranged to have him put in here. And once he was here, the brute made an assault on one of my overseers. It is quite impossible. There was a little silence then, as the word impossible swirled in the room like smoke from a cheap cigar. 4,000, the cop said. Rupees, Wickram asked. Dollars, the cop laughed. American dollars, 4,000 extra. Two for us and our associates, and two for the inspector who's married to the slut. Are there any more, Lynn? We could have muttered earnestly. I'm just asking, like, because we're working our way up to a group discount here, you know? I stared back at him. The fever was stinging my eyes, and the effort it took to sit upright in the chair was causing me to sweat and shiver. He reached out, leaning over so that his hands were resting on my bare knees. I had the thought that some of the body lice might creep from my legs onto his hands, but I couldn't brush that reassuring touch aside. It's gonna be cool, man. Don't worry. I'll be back soon. We'll get you the fuck out of here within the hour. I promise. I'll be back with two taxis for us and your guys. Bring three taxis, I answered, my voice sounding as though it came from a new, dark, deep place that was opening up as I began to accept that I might be free. One taxi for you, and the other two for me and the guys, I said, because body lice. Okay, he flinched. Three taxis. You got it. Half an hour later, I rode with Rahim in the back of a black and yellow Fiat taxi through the tectonic spectacle and pedestrian pageant of the city. Rahim had obviously received some treatment. His arms were encased in plaster casts, but he was thin and sick, and horror clogged his eyes. I felt nauseous just looking into those eyes. He never said a word except to tell us where he wanted to go. He was crying softly and silently when we dropped him off at a restaurant that Hassan Obikwa owned in Dongri. As we drove on, the driver kept staring at my gaunt, starved, beaten face in his rear vision mirror. Finally, I asked him in rough colloquial Hindi if he had any Indian movie songs in his car. Stunned, he replied that he did. I nominated one of my favorites, and he found it, cranking it up to the max as we buzzed and beeped our way through the traffic. It was a song that the prisoners in the long room had passed from group to group. They sang it almost every night. I sang it as the taxi took me back into the smell and color and sound of my city. The driver joined in, looking often into the mirror. None of us lie or guard our secrets when we sing. And India is a nation of singers whose first love is the kind of song we turn to when crying just isn't enough. The song was still soaring in me as I shed my clothes into a plastic bag for disposal and stood under the strong warm jet of water in Wickram's shower. I tipped a whole bottle of Dettol disinfectant over my head and scrubbed it into my skin with a hard nail brush. A thousand cuts and bites and gashes cried out, but my thoughts were of Carla. Vikram told me she'd left the city two days before. No one seemed to know where she'd gone. How will I find her? Where is she? Does she hate me now? Does she think I dumped her after we made love? Could she think that about me? 
I have to stay in Bombay. She'll come back here to the city. I have to stay and wait for her. I spent two hours in that bathroom, thinking, scrubbing, and clenching my teeth against the pain. My wounds were raw when I emerged to wrap a towel around my waist and stand in Wickram's bedroom. Oh, man, he groaned, shaking his head and cringing in sympathy. I looked into the full-length mirror on the front of his wardrobe. I'd used his bathroom scales to check my weight. I was 45 kilos, half the 90 kilos I'd been when I was arrested four months before. My body was so thin that it resembled those of men who'd survived concentration camps. The bones of my skeleton were all visible, even to the skull beneath my face. Cuts and sores covered my body, and beneath them was the tortoise shell pattern of deep bruises everywhere. Kader heard about you from two of the guys who got out of your dormitory, some Afghan guys. They said they saw you with Kader one night when you went to see some blind singers and they remembered you from there. I tried to picture the men, to remember them, but I couldn't. Afghans, we could have had said. They must have been very good at keeping secrets because they'd never spoken to me in all those months in the locked room. Whoever they were, I owed them. When they got out, they told Kader about you, and Kader sent for me. Why you? He didn't want anyone to know that he was the one getting you out. The price was steep enough, Yad. If they knew it was him paying the bakshish, the price would have been a lot higher. But how do you know him? I asked, still staring with fascinated horror at my own torture and emaciation. Who? Kader Bhai. How do you know him? Everybody in Kolaba knows him, man. Sure, but how do you know him? I did a job for him once. What sort of job? It's kind of a long story. I've got time if you have. We could have smiled and shook his head. He stood and crossed the bedroom to pour two drinks at a small table that served as his private bar. One of Kader Pai's gundas beat up a rich kid in a nightclub, he began, handing me a drink. He did him over pretty bad. From what I hear, the kid had it coming, but his family pressed charges with the cops. Kader Pai knew my dad, and from him he found out that I knew the kid. We went to the same damn college yard. He got in touch with me and asked me to find out how much they wanted to drop the case. Turns out they wanted plenty, but Kader paid it, and a little more. He could have got heavy with them, you know, and scared the shit out of them. He could have fucking killed them, Yad, the whole fucking family. But he didn't. His guy was in the wrong, nah? So he wanted to do the right thing. He paid the money, and everyone ended up happy. He's okay, that Kader Pai. A real serious type, if you know what I mean. But he's okay. My dad respects him, and he likes him. And that's saying quite a lot, because my pop, he doesn't respect many, many members of the human race. You know, Kader told me he wants you to work for him. Doing what? Don't ask me, he shrugged. He began to toss some clean, pressed clothes from his wardrobe onto the bed. One by one, I accepted the shorts, trousers, shirt, and sandals, and began to dress. He just told me to bring you to see him when you feel well enough. I'd think about it if I was you, Lynn. You need to feed yourself up. You need to make some fast bucks. And you need a friend like him, Yad. All that stuff about Australia, it's a fucking wild story, man. I swear, being on the run and all, it's damn heroic. At least with Kader at your, on your side, you'll be safe here. With him behind you, nobody will ever do this shit to you again. You got a powerful friend there, Lynn. Nobody fucks with Kader Khan in Bombay. So why don't you work for him, I asked. And I knew that the tone of my voice was harsh, harsher than I'd intended it to be. But everything I said sounded like that then, with memories of the beatings and the body lice still slicing and itching across my skin. I never got invited, we could have replied evenly. But even if I did get invited to join him, I don't think I'd take him up on it, Yad. Why not? I don't need him the way you do, Lynn. All those mafia guys, they need each other. You know what I mean? They need Kadabai as much as he needs them. And I don't need him like that. But you do. You sound very sure, I said, turning to meet his eye. I am sure. Kadabai, he told me that he found out why you got picked up and put in jail. He said that someone powerful, someone with a lot of influence, had you put away, man. 
Who was it? He didn't say. He told me he doesn't know. Maybe he just didn't want to tell me. Whatever the case, Lynn, my brother, you're paddling in some fucking deep shit. The bad guys don't fuck around in Bombay. You know that much by now. And if you've got an enemy here, you're going to need all the protection you can get. You've got two choices. Get the fuck out of town or get some firepower on your side, like the guys at the OK Corral, you know? What would you do? He laughed, but my expression didn't change, and he let the laughter quickly fade. He lit two cigarettes and passed one to me. Me? I'd be fucking angry, Yara. I don't wear this cowboy stuff because I like cows. I wear it because I like the way those cowboy fuckers handle things in those days. Me? I'd want to find out who tried to fuck me over, and I'd want to get some damn revenge on him. Me, when I was ready, I'd accept Cotter's offer and go to work for him and get my revenge. But hey, that's me. And I'm an Indian ma Marachur, Yar. And that's what an Indian Marachur would do. I looked in the mirror once more. The new clothes felt like salt on the raw wounds, but they covered the worst of it, and I looked less alarming less confronting, less hideous. I smiled at the mirror. I was practicing, trying to remember what it was like to be me. It almost worked. I almost had it. Then a new expression, not quite my own, swirled into the gray of my eyes. Never again. That pain wouldn't happen to me again. That hunger wouldn't threaten me. That fear wouldn't pierce my exiled heart. Whatever it takes, my eyes said to me, whatever it takes from now on. I'm ready to see him, I said. I'm ready right now. <laughs>